water, salt, electrolytes. I'm going to teach you guys everything I've learned over the past six years on the carnivore diet, as well as the four years of experimenting, research, anecdotes beforehand. Now, this video is going to be a little bit longer than usual because you have to understand all of these components in order to apply them to achieve optimal health. And for those of you dummies out there who need a little help, uh, feel free to reach out to me for a consultation. I do have my email in the description. I'll touch on that later, but uh, we're going to talk about water, electrolytes, sodium, and there is a lot of information, but at the end of this video, once you see what I actually do during the day, you're going to be like, Frank, why don't you just tell me what to do? But it helps to understand why I'm doing it. So first we got to understand there are two main components to water, the physical and the chemical components, the physical being rated in parts per million as total dissolved solids, like maybe your water has too much lead, like I'm, I don't know what the Flint, Michigan water is contaminated with, but that could be it. Uh, and then the negative chemical components like antibiotics, bacteria, chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, fluoride, chlorine, many negative chemicals can also be in the water. So we need to remove any negative physical and chemical components and then optimize the physical components with ideal mineral ratios. Parts per million is on a scale generally from zero to 400. 0 to 50 is reverse osmosis, distilled. This is where New York City water actually falls. And although people think New York City water tastes good because it has a low parts per million, it has a very high negative chemical component to it. And almost every one of my clients from New York City, I think I've had about five now, they're drinking insane amounts of New York City water and it's not hydrating them. And I actually met a person who would drink New York City tap water and you'd have to go to the bathroom five minutes later because it had low parts per million it didn't hydrate him and it had so many negative chemical components that he had to get it out of his body. So there's definitely something to be said about that and it's something that I've noticed that's very apparent in my clients when they switch from New York City tap water to really just reverse osmosis or mineral water. So uh, that's 0 to 50. It doesn't really occur in nature, just distilled and osmosis. 50 to 150, it also doesn't really occur in nature. It's glacial water, maybe the Eskimos drank that. Uh, deep bedrock water, aquifers, water humans don't really have access to. 150 to 250 parts per million is where we see a lot of fresh water, a lot of like running groundwater, lakes, streams, things like that. That's where most of the water on the surface lies. Once you go above 250, hard water, high mineral water, uh, high mineral springs, things like that. And yeah, I mean, there's sometimes people have wells that have hard water. Some people have wells that have soft water. There's all different types of occurrences. It just helps to understand what the range is so we can kind of theorize about where we need to be. And it's important to understand parts per million because it can be both positive and negative having a certain parts per million depending on what the electrolyte ratios are in the water. So to be safe, you know, we just remove them if we're unable to test them. Now, how do we remove chemical components from the water? And the only real answer is either get water from a source you trust or use a reverse osmosis filter to remove as much as possible. The only real options people have are spring or well water, buying glass bottled water from the supermarket, or reverse osmosis or distillation systems. So the spring water and well water, you'll obviously know if you have that. Or you, Some people even go out to wells or springs and fill up gallon drums of water, which is impractical for most people. The bottled water from the supermarket, you know, it has to be in glass. It can add up to like six or seven hundred dollars per year eventually. You know, you don't want to drink water in plastic, so it's more cost effective to install a system. You'll save money in the long run over two or three years. And reverse osmosis versus distilled. Reverse osmosis removes some chemical components, although at the end of the day, regardless, you still don't know exactly what's in your well of water. You still don't know if that glass bottled mineral water is really from Italy. You don't know if all the negative chemical components are being removed in your reverse osmosis. Uh, but the thing on reverse osmosis versus distillation is reverse osmosis removes chemical components, distilled gets the TDS and the parts per million a little lower, which isn't really that important once you're at a certain point. But let's just look at my uh, water system real quick. So reverse osmosis is always usually a sediment filter, two carbon filters, a fluoride filter, chlorine filter, and then the deodorizer. And then it's stored in a tank. And then it comes out here, up here. So mine is from APEC. I spent about $200 on this and my neighbor installed it. Uh, you can get 
<clears throat> various ones depending on how much water you need. If you want to get a whole house system, that might cost you like one or two or three thousand dollars. But now we have water that we know has no negative physical components and no negative chemical components. And if you do have well or spring water, you can buy tests for these things and figure it out. And you can test your tap water. For me, I know what I've seen come out of my pipes. I need to filter it anyway. So now we need to understand electrolytes and salt. And potassium, sodium, magnesium, and calcium occur in meat in certain ratios. And these electrolyte ratios are what I like to look at for kind of reference. 1400 potassium, 250 sodium, 80 magnesium, 40 calcium. Keep in mind, calcium should never be supplemented because the form of calcium that occurs in food and nature is usually in the form of calcium oxalate or calcium carbonate, which is generally not bioavailable to the human digestive system. So the reason we don't want to supplement any of these minerals individually is because, or electrolytes that is, is because it's very easy to overdose them. You know, it's not what we would have done in nature, and in most cases, it's not necessary. I mean, I know there's that snake juice guy that tells you to drink your own piss and put a ton of potassium and salt in water. I know there's some people that put like 10 grams of salt in water per day, but looking at the electrolytes that naturally occur in a pound of meat answers a lot of questions. And the main reason we don't want to add electrolytes like this to our water is because although we know what forms of chelated minerals occur in foods in nature, we don't know how this is processed, you don't know what effects it's having on your metabolism. It's one thing to correct a deficiency once in a blue moon, but to consume them every day is not ideal. One thing really interesting is if you put mineral powders in water, obviously just magnesium will taste a certain way, just potassium will taste a certain way, but if you put the minerals in the water, in the ratios that naturally occur in meat, the water tastes like nothing, even if you put a ton of minerals in it. And that water is very satiating, like you take a sip of it and you're done. So just one real interesting topic. But the main reason we don't want to add electrolytes into our water is because there's about 15 to 20 different types. Certain ones are toxic, they have different bioavailabilities. No studies have really been done on these. And here are the forms. Aspartate, malate, citrate, glyconate, taurate, oxide, orotate, chloride, lactate, sulfite, carbonate, citrate, malate, gluconate, you know, bioavailability is questionable of certain ones. How were they really made? The ones that occur in food, for potassium, it's citrate. For sodium, it's chloride. For magnesium, it's oxalate. And I believe it might be glyconate or taurate in meat. And then calcium is either calcium oxalate or calcium carbonate. So what potassium citrate means, it's potassium bound to a citric acid molecule. You know, sodium chloride is sodium bound to a chloride molecule. Uh, you know, uh, magnesium glyconate is magnesium bound to a glycine molecule. So this gets really complicated and it's why I don't like messing around with it. Although if maybe I think I had too much salt one day and I put a little potassium in my water and I feel better, I try not to do it consistently on a consistent basis. I mean, here I have, you know, I have zinc gluconate, and the reason I bought zinc was because I thought maybe I had a copper overdose from eating too much liver, but something like zinc gluconate, it's so bad on your stomach, you should never be consuming something like this. It literally makes you sick. I should probably just throw it out. Uh, same with calcium citrate. You shouldn't be consuming these unnatural forms of minerals. I have these because I've experimented with them in the past. The only thing I would say you could ever supplement would be potassium citrate, magnesium glyconate or magnesium, I mean malate is questionable, citrate makes you shit your pants so I don't really know, um, and then sodium chloride is fine, potassium chloride I don't know. The main problem with potassium is a lot of these supplements they have such low, you know, it's 3% of your daily value for one serving so it's so low anyway so my advice is to stay away from these these mineral supplements. If you insist on using them and trying them and you know, the powders come in pure powder form. If you buy capsules, keep in mind, capsules generally have things added like stearates, vegetable oils, rice flour, negative things. The brand I've noticed that has the least negative things is Pure Encapsulations, you know, Vegetarian Capsule with Cellulose Water, and Ascorbyl Palmitate, which is way better than Magnesium Stearate or any of the negative things we see. But this is really expensive compared to the powders. And these powders are not tasty, guys. Like, most of you probably won't be able to choke them down. And although you could say, Frank, can you make 
a perfect electrolyte mineral mix. Right now with these, theoretically I could, but I don't want to encourage people to do that because we could do that through natural foods, consuming meat, and just adding clay and other naturally occurring minerals to our water. Once you start messing around with this, the question is, you know, was, was hexane used to make this? Was it bleached? Was it deodorized? You don't know how these things are made, so stay away. Now we can move on to salt. So, uh, salt is roughly, sea salt is roughly half sodium chloride. You definitely don't want table salt. And in regards to like Himalayan salt, a lot of people ask me about that. It has beneficial trace minerals, but Himalayan salt and Celtic salt, which I have here, are very similar in regards to their trace mineral profile. Now, of course, Celtic salt and Himalayan salt are miles better than table salt or even a lot of refined sea salts, but do those minerals make a huge difference in the context of your diet? You really shouldn't be putting a lot of salt on your food in the first place. It should just be a few grains should be all the salt you need to adjust to your taste. I mean, on the zero carb carnivore diet, most people come from eating a very high amount of salt in their food, and the type of salt you're using also matters. You know, a little sprinkle of this Celtic salt might be the equivalent of like a handful of table salt because certain salts are saltier than others due to the mineral profile, how fresh it is, if it's freshly ground. All indigenous groups consume sodium in some form, whether in shellfish, seafood, they gathered seaweed, but only since the Neolithic have people started gathering salt in primitive ways, like they dig holes, they use certain wooden tools and things to gather salt. So whether or not salt is harmful in the diet or not needed, that's out of the question. You know, we could definitely use salt in our diet. It's just, I think a lot of people are using way too much salt right now. For things like low salt and the potassium salts, you guys, you have to buy high quality salts, high quality ingredients, and use those in their natural state. You know, when you start using chemical, these are chemicals. These are not, like you can call these minerals all you want, but to me they're chemicals. So now we need to cover, you know, I guess we could talk about, did humans actually get water in nature? And, you know, I mentioned earlier the Eskimos drank a lot of glacial water, uh, the Kalahari, tribesmen, I believe that hunted gazelles and chased them on foot, only got water from like melons and the meat from the animals. So there's examples of humans having lots of water and not so much water. I know a lot of people that follow Ajanas von der Planets believe that you should get your hydration from milk, eggs, fresh raw juices and things like that, but there's too many negative, first of all, most of that stuff's impractical. Some people are allergic to milk and eggs like me. Some people don't want to spend all that money on fresh juice and vegetables. That's not affordable. And the herbicides and pesticides on modern vegetables are way worse than any water. And most people don't have access to blood or are not willing to drink it. So the Ajanas von der Planets, raw primal people who only want to get water from food, that's a bit impractical. That being said, is there warrant to it? If we were in our ideal ind indigenous health, possibly, but I don't think so. Uh, getting moisture from only foods in the diet you know, I think it's more about optimizing food intake, reducing the volume of food you're eating, increasing the quality of the water you're drinking, increasing the mineral density of the diet. You know, we didn't really touch on soil demineralization and how a lot of foods now are lower in various minerals and other components. Uh, that's definitely something to consider when eating a food. It has a lower mineral content than it should. Another thing to consider is phytic acid and anti-nutrients in certain plant foods. Although, you know, phytic acid does inhibit calcium absorption, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, we don't really need a lot of calcium in our body. Uh, magnesium is inhibited, but not 100%. So when you consume a food that has oxalates or phytic acid, not all of the magnesium absorption is inhibited. And it usually doesn't inhibit potassium absorption too much. When we talk about using natural electrolyte sources, you know, here I have uh, sweet potatoes that my family had earlier. You know, they're an excellent source of all the minerals, magnesium, potassium. Uh, you know, here we, I mean, this is an example of hydration, eggs for raw hydration. Uh, here I have some, this is dulse, this is seaweed from Maine Coast Sea Vegetables. Dulse, uh, or any seaweed really, is super high in potassium. That's what I mainly use it for. It's an excellent source of potassium. It has enough magnesium and calcium as well and a decent amount of sodium. Of course, ton of iodine. Seaweed is probably the healthiest plant food you can eat out of anything. Uh, I can't really think of something else. And this is some uh, raw cacao that Tristan from Primal Edge Health sent me. Uh, raw cacao can be a good source of certain minerals as well. Uh, there's definitely some plant foods that you can apply that are healthy uh, if you want to add minerals that way. 
But I don't do that because I'm either allergic to those foods, I don't digest them, I'm intolerant to them, or I just don't really want to eat them at all. Uh, the seaweed is main coast sea vegetables. They do low temperature dehydration. Uh, you guys can look into that. I don't really have seaweed at all. Uh, I might start doing it again. I think it's very beneficial and a very healthy food. Uh, what else do we have to touch on? Finally, Frank, you're going to tell me what you do with your water. Yes. This is going to be the last part of the video. So, we've gone over water, parts per million, total dissolved solids, various negative physical and chemical components, how to optimize that and start with a good baseline of water, which we have here. We went over electrolytes and why you shouldn't necessarily be supplementing electrolytes and messing around with mineral ratios unless you know you have a deficiency and you know, there's just too many different types of chelated minerals. Uh, you know, we mentioned that these will taste right in ideal ratios and I'm not, I'm not showing you guys that. I, pro I think I did it in one of the past videos, but I'm not encouraging that. Uh, the problem with trace mineral supplements, which I didn't touch on, is you don't know what types of chelated minerals are in those trace mineral supplements, and they're not usually in ideal ratios anyway. Usually the sodium is way too high, uh, magnesium is usually too high, potassium is too low. Uh, we talked about indigenous groups and their habits, and how that, you know, it kind of applies right now. Uh, we spoke about, uh, you know, I mean, humans used to get all these wild plants and various, you know, about 30% of our diet was wild plants in a lot of cases where we got a much higher mineral consumption. Uh, we spoke about different types of salt, Himalayan salt, Celtic salt, any of those high quality artisanal salts is what you want. You know, although the mineral profile in the big picture of your diet might not make too much of a difference, everything counts. And the last thing we need to talk about is what well, we touched on, the phytic acid, the oxalates, how they inhibit mineral absorption. Although these foods like sweet potato, uh, seaweed, and chocolate all have oxalates, the net mineral benefit in the body is still a positive. The last thing to talk about is clay, because clay is what I actually put in my water. There's four types of clay. There's kaolin clay that occurs in Asia, and I believe, I believe it's predominantly in Asia and maybe parts of Europe and Africa, especially Africa. Uh, there's illite clay, which occurs in Europe, Africa, and Asia as well. There's montmorillonite smectite clay, which I believe is all over the place. And then there's chlorite clay, but chlorite usually isn't classified as clay to my understanding. So I actually have kaolin clay and illite clay here. I used to supplement as my mineral powder per recommendation of Paul Check, but then I found out that bentonite clays have heavy metals, so I stopped using it. Although I drank that for years and never had any problems. Bentonite clays are a derivative of montmorillonite clay. So you definitely don't want to use bentonite clay in your water for that concern. So the illite clay I have here is from Italy. Of course I had to buy the Italian clay. But this illite clay has like a funky aftertaste. It doesn't mix well in water. The molecules are a bit large. So I also bought some kaolin clay and this is much more powdery. It's from parts of Africa. It has a much more pleasant taste. So this is my preferred clay that I put in my water. A lot of you guys have asked me about the diatomaceous earth, but this is like decomposed shellfish. It's not something I would consider using every day. Maybe once in a while for a cleanse or something, but although diatomaceous earth is mostly silica, I just am not comfortable recommending it to be consumed on a daily basis. Uh, the common clay is the safest bet. And, you know, I had a video a while ago that I deleted we should eat dirt or something like that. And a lot of third world countries will make, they will eat dirt, they will make biscuits out of animal fat and clay. Uh, they use this to remineralize their water. So this is basically the most natural source of minerals and the real only reliable source of minerals you can add to your water. I mean, not only does clay have a lot of health and digestive benefits, the mineral profile of this will hydrate you uh, depending on how much you need. Okay, so, Calvin clay needs to be put in water to hydrate it, make it more bioavailable, so to speak, easier to digest. I put it in a jar with some water. Ironically, this jar is labeled sheet milk, and it looks like sheet milk, but if you tasted this, it does not taste like sheet milk. So this has, uh, you know, I would not say this is unpleasant at all. It just tastes like drinking clay. And what I do when I wake up is I usually just drink a couple glasses of only reverse osmosis water, no clay in it. Once I have one or two of those, and I feel like I'm hydrated, if I still get thirsty, then I start adding clay to my water. The amount 
doesn't really matter, so to speak. You know, if you put a small amount in, then your body would probably want to drink more of the water. If I just took a, this is like, this is like one part clay, one part water. So if I took a swig out of this, my body would say, okay, Frank, stop drinking it. That's enough minerals. So all I really do is I pour a little bit of the water. I fill the glass up and then I drink it. And then I, you know, I drink it based on, I'm not thirsty now, but uh, I'll drink it based on my taste for the water. And this is what I do every day. This is what I've been doing for years and years and years. And this is what I found works to be the best out of everything. Uh, it's a natural way to do it. There's no real pollution concerns. You're, you know, you're reducing the amount of products you're putting in your body. I think this is really the most practical and easiest way for people to uh, remineralize their water. And if you're one of those people who are buying glass bottled mineral water from the store, you don't really have to add the clay in, although you could try it and see how it works for you. But I think I've covered everything, guys. For me, this video was hopefully one of not it's the, of course not gonna be the last time I'll talk about this but I've made many videos talking about electrolytes and theorizing things and every one of those videos over the past few years have been wrong to some degree you know I used to think that like a couple months ago you can make an ideal mineral ratio with that but I still had reservations about where the powders were sourced and how they were made just because there's very little information to access in regards to that uh, you know, before that, I would think that, I mean, I was never into the, the wisdom that people on keto needed to consume 5 grams of salt a day and all this potassium and all this stuff. You definitely need your electrolytes in certain forms, but you can do that through natural foods. You don't need to supplement stuff. You might need a little extra salt on your food initially, but, uh, you know, there's no reason to mess around with all this stuff. I mean... You know, the seaweed is one thing to tr mess around with, but, you know, once you get into mineral supplements, it gets way too complicated. Uh, I think the main problem that people really have is just that their source of water is either polluted with chemicals or it doesn't have an ideal parts per million. I, I, it's either a combination of both or one or the other. So, thank you guys for watching. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I do offer consultations. I'm trying to get a website up and running. I got a mess around with WordPress and Elementor and try to figure out how to get a landing page. Um, yeah, if you guys like to support me, above all, just share the channel. Let me know how you like this video. Uh, I, I feel like all of the information, all of the experimenting I've done on electrolytes has led me to this conclusion, you know? I've tried everything I've mentioned. I've tried, you know, I've done this clay in the water for years and years and years. I've done just reverse osmosis water for a period of time. I've only tried subsisting on blood and milk and the juices like the Ajanis Bonaplanis diet. Unfortunately, I'm allergic to milk. I have a problem with eggs. That didn't work out. I've, you know, I've tried restricting my salt intake. I've done completely raw primal without salt. And what I've noticed is that every indigenous group consumed both raw and cooked food. So the hydration of those foods is not a concern. You don't have to go only raw. Every indigenous group had salt in some form, and there are indigenous groups that drank tons of water, and there are indigenous groups that didn't really drink any water. So, uh, it's safe to say that, you know, what I've surmised from this is the reverse osmosis water with clay in it is closest to what we would have gotten in nature, considering the soil demineralization, considering, you know, what water we might have had access to. So, hopefully this helps some of you guys out. I know it could have been as simple as Guys, I'll show you what I do, just do this, but I think all of these things were necessary to speak on, and for those of you guys who are saying, oh, well, the snake diet guy says to drink your own piss, and uh, Sverage says you need to, like, juice 10 pounds of fennel that have been sprayed with glyphosate, like, please, guys, I I'm not commenting on those things. I think if you have enough common sense, you can try to figure out that, you know, there's a difference between extremes and looking at everything from a practical perspective, so... Um, I did have to take notes for this, guys. This was like uh, just too many points that I didn't want to forget and I actually recorded this a couple times because I kept missing like one point along the way. So thank you guys for, who tuned in for this long period of time. Hopefully this answered a lot of questions you guys might have had.